make them feel special, give them early access, give them, you know, give an ear from your de uh, dev team, your product team to them for their ideas, you know, find opportunities to bring them on stage, highlight them, whatever, but like make them feel like they're actually appreciated, which they should be, and then enable them to be able to go out and spread the word. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to this episode of B2B EQ. Uh, today's guest is not only a good friend of mine, but he is a growth marketing mastermind. Although his title may not say he's a marketer these days, I know it's in his roots. He's literally grown up in startups. He's helped grow three top 100 Inc. fast growing private companies. And when it comes to achieving growth, he is a force to be reckoned with. COO at Rev Genius, one of my favorite sales communities. Jason Hubbard. Jason, great to have you. Tim, it's awesome to be on here with you. And you uh, you make me sound so much better than I am. <laughs> Are you kidding? I, I think one of my first forays in tech marketing, we got to work a little bit together. We got to build this friendship years ago. I've watched the journey. We were just talking offline about some amazing things you did recently prior to joining Rep Genius. Now I have lots to learn from you, sir. Excited to have you on. <laughs> well, you flatter me regardless. Hey, well... <laughs> That's, that's part of this. It's got to be fun, right? So <laughs> I'm going to kick it off with a question that we ask all of our guests in B2B sales. What is the one soft skill that creates impact both on relationships and on revenue? Uh, it's, it extends beyond sales. It's pretty universal. It's the number one thing I look for when I'm hiring is intellectual curiosity. Um, because if you're intellectually curious, like you're going to go out, you're going to learn things, you're going to listen. Um, you're going to be constantly looking for the newest thing, the next edge, uh, all of that stuff. And so it is the most critical skill. And it's one I'm, I'm not convinced it can be taught. I am 100% certain I suck at teaching it. Um, but if you, if you come with that and you come with hustle, I can do just about anything with you. I, that's, that's a true trait. It's, it's the ability to learn, the ability to want to learn and grow, and then to actually apply it. I think of you and I, I one, one picture came to mind. It was a, a picture of curious George. So all these lessons are taught when we're little kids, right? If we just go back to those core fundamental beliefs. Absolutely. I feel like we're going to talk a lot about going back to core things. I, you know, EQ is one of those topics and in in sales today we, we were talking offline everything has changed so much like the marketplace right now is kind of upended people don't know what they've been doing the last five ten years is not giving them the same roi that they were getting what are the foundational things you said curiosity i want to want to click into that what are the best reps doing when they engage with prospects from a curious side the the number one things they're doing, I think, whether it's sales, demand, gen, whatever, uh, what the name of the game is now and for the foreseeable future. And this is where you know, tech's a double-edged sword, obviously. it's uh, Tech has a lot to do with how we got in this place where all of the things that we had as tactics and playbooks for the last five, 10 years started to break. But the other side of it is like we have insights into and data on all kinds of signals that we never had. And so if you're creative, if you're curious and you want to go mine those signals, you can actually get to a level of intent that you can never get to. And if you're leveraging that, like that's a game changer. Um, and, you know, you can actually get to the point of like, not only is there intent or this is somebody that's looking for a solution or ready to buy, but you can get all the way down to like, these are their hot buttons. These are their problems they're trying to solve for. These are, this is what they're trying to fix, whatever. And if you can go to them, like, and just by chance, like, hey, we just had this article. I thought you might be interested in it. It just happens to be exactly what they're needing or what they're looking for. Like, holy crap. But all of that goes back to just value add, trying to help. Um, and at the end of the day, like, that's, it's not like that's changed or that's novel. That's the way it's always really been. It's just sort of everything forcing us back to basics with this stuff. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I was on a, a recent discovery call and I felt like I was interrogated. And at the end of the day, I, I had no problem sharing my issues, right? It kind of feels like therapy or like I get to let out all the challenges and the things I'm facing. This was great. Now, the, the sales rep was probably not expecting those things. Won't talk you know, <laughs> but but uh, at the same time, it was you're looking for that person. I feel like that can solution with you. Like, like the person that can kind of pick up the paintbrush and say, oh, okay, this is what you're trying to go after. Like, let's, let's paint the picture together. Let's, let's get there together. That's an art form that's getting lost in what we've done for the last five years of, I think, hit a market really hard, get some attention, get anybody that can take a demo or wants to take a demo, hell, even pay them to take a demo. So I can interrogate you and, and ask you a bunch of questions about my product. Well, and I mean, it's the, you know, it, it, it's the 800 pound gorilla for most of us in tech, which is how do we deal with this churn issue? And that gets to that, you know, do you understand the problem, what I'm trying to solve for? Are you going to help me figure out how to implement this, how to oper operationalize it? Because guess what? Like the people you're selling to are rarely the people that are actually implementing the solution on it. And, you know, like everything, I mean, tech is a tool and tools are only as effective as you effectively use or leverage them. And you, you and I know well enough, like if you get hacky with things, you can make tools do a lot outside of just like that core, like, you know, this is what our use cases are. It's like, no, if you've got somebody on the other side of it that can help you with that and understand what you're trying to solve for, like you can do all kinds of things above and beyond as a power user within it. Oh, and that's, that's the amazing thing with these technologies. I, I got humbled greatly. I was redoing a, a house and, you know, you, you're meeting with the contractors and the framers are standing there and I've used a hammer before, but I've <laughs> never seen the amount of things you can do with a hammer when you watch those guys on a framing job site, right? You think, oh, that's a simple tool. Well, now <laughs> we've got technology with these big platforms. You've got AI in the mix. You've got millions of features. And I feel like we only use if we're not working with a solution provider, really kind of coming up with those custom things, we only use a, a small point of what we can actually do. Oh, I mean, and it also goes to the heart of like tech bloat and having multiple solutions that can do the same thing. And I mean, all of this comes down to like people not understanding, you know, their tooling and what they're able to do with it. But, you know, and it raises the question, is that ultimately primarily on the customer? Is that primarily on the solution provider, uh, I'm pretty much in the camp that it's on the solution provider to be able to educate them, understand what they're trying to do. And that highlights how poor of a job most of us are doing around that. It, well, and that's because most of us are looking at, we've got to get the deal. We've got to get the sale. We've got to finish out our quarter strong. We've got revenue targets, like all of those things. I've got a lot of empathy for sellers that, that run on that treadmill every single quarter, every single year. But at the same time, I think Going back to curiosity, what can sellers then do? How can they spend maybe more of their time being curious to make those deals move or to to get better traction and trust in the marketplace? Absolutely. And I mean, it, you know, it's a, there's the piece of the, are the salespeople doing a good enough job on that front? In my experience, most of them are doing a really good job on that front. Yeah. It's the handoff then to success and success winds up if they don't know all of that, then you know, best case scenario, they go back through an entire discovery process all over again, which is annoying AF. Yeah. Uh, worst case scenario, it's just a playbook implementation. It's like the same thing every time. And hey, here's some, you know, here's a KB and here's some articles or some videos, whatever, like go help yourself. And it's like, this needs to be a coordinated process. Well, and I think it needs a community around it. I was on my last episode and, and uh, with podcasts and some of those, Casey was talking about community and how important, like you start these initial conversations with your initial user groups, and then you move into this community where people that are using the solution day in and day out, it's only maybe two or three people or four people at your company, but it's like four or five or 10,000 people globally that are now part of this community learning how to do this or do that or implement these different things. And I think some of the biggest and brightest companies in the world in software have done that community piece really well. Absolutely. And if you, and you, know, you have to think through and you've got to be a little bit you know, more open-minded than what most people are thinking when they think community. Yeah. So whenever they think community, they're thinking more often than not, an additional touch point where the company or the solution provider 
can hear what they're struggling with and be able to reach out to them and ideally be able to help them. And then the other, and arguably what most people are looking at and saying, like, this is the real reason we want community. So they can all help each other. Um, and we don't have to be in the mix. But arguably the most important part of it, and the one that most people don't do well enough, is listen to them for ideas for the product. And also, these are your power users. Like, even if you're eating your own dog food and you're using your own product internally and you're all power users there, I guarantee you there are people out there doing creative, innovative stuff with it that nobody ever thought of. And like now, okay, holy crap, like now these are additional use cases. These are customers you can go highlight. These are, uh, yep, uh, uh, yep, whatever. But I mean, you can do all kinds of stuff with that because like, it's cool. It's exciting. It's like, hey, look at what all of these people are figuring out how to do with this. And it's not just cookie cutter. And it may be no different from a tech standpoint than your competition, but that you highlight that, that you recognize that, that you heard that, and then you can go bring that to the surface and share that sets you apart. A hundred percent. Well, and, and for those marketers out there that, you know, we always struggle with, we got to go to this person, they've got to sign a release. Then we got to get a case study from them. If you're hearing that straight from them in the community, like how much easier is it to validate and just go to that person and say, be my power user, tell me about this, or go tell these other companies because exactly. they're all trying to do the same thing. And it doesn't have to be on a website, but it makes the same impact. And enable them to go share this. It doesn't have to be like a quid pro quo. We're going to incentivize you this, whatever, like, you know, make them feel special, give them early access, give them, you know, give an ear from your de uh, dev team, your product team to them for their ideas, you know, find opportunities to bring them on stage, highlight them, whatever, but like make them feel like they're actually appreciated, which they should be, and then enable them to be able to go out and spread the word. I, the, that, the evangelist part, we've seen that become a role at companies, but what an amazing thing to be able to propel customers to be that role. Absolutely. That's, that's some secret sauce. Um, now, talking about community, you're COO of Rev Genius. I've seen Rev Genius grow exponentially over the last few years. Love the tractions it, it's had. Love the fact that I can get on a Slack channel and communicate directly with sellers all around the globe. What's it been like growing that community? And I know you've joined just recently. So what are some of the big things that you're looking at? What are the benefits of the sales communities? What are you seeing some of the challenges in the, in the, the future for those? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great question. Lots of angles to the answer. Um, so I did just start back in November, I guess it was, as COO. Uh, I had been working with Rev Genius. Uh, they were a client of mine for a while, but I've known Jared since... I think about a month after he started Rev Genius. In fact, I you know, I met him because I was running partnerships at a previous company. And so we were starting to do some events with them very, very early on. And you know, he made the intro to my CRO at the last company that I was at. So I've been intimately familiar with and working, you know, and a member of Rev Genius kind of from the start. Um, it, but you know, some of the biggest problem, not really problems, challenges within it. And I think these are challenges within any community, but especially when you start getting to our size, like the, the scale of it becomes really challenging. So we've got 35,000 members that we're closing in on it's a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and you know, for a lot of people, like, there's the advantages that we've got all of the content and yeah, with 35,000 people, there's people in any role that you would want to be able to talk to or anything like that. There's all kinds of conversations going on but it's a lot of noise. Um, and so trying to navigate that and find your way around and stuff like that. And you have know, all shoots of that. The two number one things that I hear from the community that they have feedback around are uh, need better moderation. And so as you've got more people in there talking about more things, you've got more opportunities for people to be, you know, trying to pitch things or say things they shouldn't be saying and stuff like that. And it's inevitable. And you know, I like to believe most of them are not realizing or aware of that they're doing something against guidelines whenever they do that. And most of them are apologetic and, you know, uh, you know, adjust their, what they're doing whenever they do that. But, you know, that's a challenge. It's always a challenge to moderate, but it's especially whenever you get that big. And then the other is just like trying to figure out their way around it and find their little niche. And so what you see with a lot of those people is they find like their little piece of Rev Genius that they plug into and then that's it. Like, you know, that's all Rev Genius is to them. And so there's all of this value that's out there that they're not seeing. And so, you know, 
what do you do about the stuff? Uh, you know, it's been kind of interesting to me. I came in from a, you know, uh, yeah, B2B SaaS background, I cut my teeth in a, you know, high velocity, low to no touch PLG motion, um, you know, largely a B2C motion that we were running at, uh, at Cirrus. And so I came into it, I was like, this is really no different than how you need to try and optimize for a PLG SaaS app. You know, you've got three primary things you need to look at. You need acquisition of new members. You need activation of those members. So are they getting in? Are they engaging? Are they doing those initial things? And then you need retention and engagement afterwards. Um, the same thing you would look at if you've got like a free trial model and a PLG motion. Um, and so we're trying to use a data-driven approach to that. So if we make this tweak here, if we change this here, if we give them a nudge there, What's that doing to our weekly active members within the community? And so that's our North Star metric and everything that we're doing. And it's especially critical for us as far as our go-to-market monetization strategy, because we make money by selling sponsorships of you know, content and events, just like we're doing with Unifor. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's always a tension between monetizing that and providing value to the community. And so what's the easiest way to try and gauge how well you're balancing that? It's looking at the engagement of weekly active users. Is, are we doing a better job with that or worse job with that? That's fascinating. And, you know, one thing I want to drill in for the, the individual contributors out here that are connecting in these communities that are going on and saying, okay, I've got access to the Slack channel. I see this content going through. How do I make traction? What are some of the things you've seen? What are some of the strategies that people have employed? And, and by that, I mean, really, it's just, you know, the, the soft skills, the people skills that have made people successful about building community and, and getting engaged. Yeah, it's really not that hard. It's listen and find ways to help. And if you can do those two things, whether you're trying to build a community, whether you're trying to grow one, whether you're trying to just engage within one as a member, it's really as simple as that. Like find ways to help, find ways to lean in and listen, listen to what people are talking about and needing. I, I like that. There's a lot of different topics going on in Rev Genius right now, from ops to enablement to, you know, new products and all those things. But you said something, don't get on there and just pitch. So my question, and this may be controversial, but is the pitch dead? I... Like most things, it depends on how you define pitch. <laughs> yep. Yep. I, I uh, yeah, I mean, like a straight, like, hey, I got your ear for 20 seconds. Let me give you my elevator pitch. Yeah, I'd say so for a variety of reasons. Uh, not the least of, by the time you're talking to them, especially if you're talking to somebody who's qualified, they're already the majority of the way to a decision. Um, so like your entry-level pitch isn't going to talk to where they are in that journey. And there's no way to figure out where they are in that journey and what they need to hear unless you've heard them first. And you go back to the listening side, right? It's, it's okay, can I find this? Oh, this person's talking about something that's in my wheelhouse that, I'm a, that I feel good about or I can add value to. Okay, now yep. I have an opportunity to engage. So for, for the advice out there, I think one of the things you're saying is like, get in these communities, like, give some, give some love and, and listen. And, and then no, for, I mean, they're, listen, they're full. listen, and then lean on where your strengths are, where your expertise are. And if you're doing that, if you're sharing that, then you're providing value. You're giving help to within the community. The rest will follow from there. Um, you know, well, I mean, whenever I've run my agencies, it's been the same story. Like most of my clients have come from me just stepping in and saying, oh, hey, you need help with this. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I had a call with somebody uh, earlier today, like they couldn't get their DNS settings to work right at all. They couldn't get an email out. And it was like, yeah, sure, we'll hop on. We'll see if we can give you a hand and help you out. And we were able to solve it for them. And then they were like, oh, hey, uh, I saw this about you. I, can we have a follow-up conversation about this or this? And I'm like, yeah, of course. Like, but, you know, you don't go into it expecting that or trying to, you know, have that be the outcome. If you do, it's going to blow up in your face. Like you need to go in there and do it because it's the right thing to do. And then just know that if you do that, you do that enough that the rest is going to follow. Well, and you're leading me back to a question that, that I think is, is interesting, but EQ has been a topic, leaders, teams, everybody mentions it. It's a buzzword that's been out there for a long time, but why now? 
Well, what what is change that's making those people that are really socially aware, self aware, listening, have that upper foot now compared to even maybe five or ten years ago? Uh, well, it's because most of the easy buttons have blown up in our faces. So, uh, if you don't, I mean, let's face it. EQ, listening, being attentive, caring enough to help all of that stuff. Like none of that's easy. Sure. Um, you know, it, it, from a skill set standpoint, it's, it's not easy. Even those of us that sort of were born equipped with it. Um, like it takes nurturing, it takes training, it takes care to do that. But the other piece to it is, is like, let's not forget listening, thinking, being creative. Like it's taxing. Um, you know, I mean, they've actually done studies of it, like where they looked at, okay, hey, we're going to have somebody work on a complicated problem and we're going to take a blood or we're going to do a blood sample and their glucose levels have dropped basically the equivalent of like a long distance runner kicking it up into sprint mode. Like it is literally taxing your body and consuming your energy levels whenever you do this. By the way, they substantiated this by giving them some candy. Uh, yeah. their ability to work harder and longer went up. Um, yeah. Also, fun little corollary. If you're ever unlucky enough to appear in front of a judge, don't do it right before lunch. Uh, they've actually looked at it. The uh, the quality of the decisions handed down and the severity of the punishments go up the longer from their last meal that judge is. That's crazy. Now, that's an interesting fact because... Not, not that we're going up in front of judges, but we're going up in front of audiences. We're all having to show up for 30 minutes on a Zoom call. We don't know necessarily where that prospect is in their buying process, right? And we've got to show up, meet them where they are, be relevant. There's a lot of stress, a lot of tension on that seller to perform in each one of those little 30 minute presentations. Oh, yeah. Way different oh, yeah. than sitting face to face. And actually, I had somebody on a call that I was on uh, earlier this week that told me something that I thought this was fascinating. It was I'd never heard it before, but we were talking about like activity metrics and tracking and all of that stuff. And of course, all the problems with, you know, hey, you need to hit a hundred dials a day and send 50 emails and whatever. Um, which, by the way, be really careful what you try and grade your reps by yeah. because they will optimize against that. I tried to do that off of calls one time, uh, very early on in my career, you know, hiring and managing BDR teams. And I walked into the room one day and I, I heard somebody get on a call where somebody picked up and there was like no pitch, no conversation about product, whatever it was, how quickly could they get off the call? Because I was grading them <laughs> on that they hit that minimum number of dials a day. So like they looked at somebody picking up as the worst thing that can happen to them. Uh, <laughs> But the flip side of it is, um, you know, she was saying that uh, somebody that she had talked to uh, had flipped the script and was saying, you can make a maximum of only 50 calls a day. Wow. Okay. So now I've got to be really intentional about who, when, and what I want to talk about. Yeah. So now, now your activity is valuable uh, to you, but also recognized by your management. And so like, I, I love that. There was a, a company I was talking to, this VP of sales, and they were saying, we're shifting from how many calls and activities and those things to at the end of the quarter, you have this many accounts. I want to see your friend map. I want to see how many people at each one of those accounts you could text, email, call, not to sell them, but because you're adding some value for them and they're adding some value for you or you've made a connection. I love that. <laughs> and it's fascinating because when you think about it, their hypothesis was this. If I have traction at the account and people buy from people we like and trust, well, then I'm moving over and I'm going to say, this account's going to buy from me. They need my service. It may not be a now, but it's going to be a sometime. So if I stay with them, when they do look, when they are in market, because I think LinkedIn put out that scares everybody, the 5% of your whole whole target audience is actually in a buying mode, probably like 1% this year with, with everything going on. Um, it, it makes you play the long game and it makes you think that's probably the better position for that company in the next two to three years as we all come out of this turn. Yeah, well, and I mean, the company may not be ready to buy yet, so you maintain, nurture that relationship, but you also have no idea where that person is going to wind up. True. Yeah, I mean, this was another one of those, you know, and I think a lot of this stuff, if you, you know, I, I teach a business ethics class at UT. And so I was talking to them. I was like, 
it's really important to have your principles that you try and you know guide yourself by. Cause like we were looking at all of these cases and I was like, well, clearly this was the right way to go, even though you know, it was also the moral thing, but look at the business results. And I was like, yeah. the key is, did they know that was going to be the result when they made that decision? And it was like, okay. Yeah. And so same story here, like do the right thing and things will follow off of it. But, you know, it was the same story when I was at Cirrus. And so like, we were looking at it and, you know, how do we divvy up these accounts that are coming in and starting free trials? And it was like, clearly, you know, the logic business logic is like focus on only the biggest accounts. And so like, if it's, yeah. you know, a company that's less than like five Salesforce users or 10 Salesforce users, whatever, like don't touch them, like don't send it to a salesperson. I was like, no everybody deserves to have an AE. Um, yeah. and so let's hand that out to them. Fast forward. It was like some of our biggest deals came from those people that started at those small orgs and then went on and moved to another org or like one of our very first customers was, uh, uh, uh optimizely. Okay. So optimizely was a customer of ours when there were nine people there. Wow. Yeah. And we grew with that company for years That's and if we had ignored Optimizely when they were a nine person company, like they would probably gone somewhere else. Totally. Well, and, and yeah, look at them now and that's probably a cornerstone client and you've got the references and everything and, and something that if I'm looking for marketing automated or any of those solutions in that space, oh, wow, I see Optimizely uses you. It's an instant credibility. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, that's tremendous. tremendous. Well, because it's so hard to get into an account now that I think what were they, there's a quote is like 70 or 80% of enterprise growth is coming from your current customers, mm -hmm. not from new accounts. So, so it goes back to the value of community, the value of expanding, building those relationships. Somebody leaves all of a sudden that account goes dark. <laughs> That's not a good situation. So all fascinating things, all in an ideal state. Where are you excited this is all going in the future? Where do you see this this moving to? The I mean, the really exciting things to me are, you know, I'm data driven. I love, I'm a geek. Uh, so the stuff that I was talking about, the intense signals, the stuff you can get data into, the democratization of things like data orchestration and CDPs where, you know, sort of like where uh, marketing automation was 15, 20 years ago, where like it, it had always been just an enterprise thing because it was yeah. so complex and it was so expensive and all of that stuff. Yeah. And now you've got, you know, different companies, you know, bringing that down to the S and B level, even starting to stack some of these layers together where you've got orchestration with ETL and a BI layer, all of that in one solution where you don't have to bolt on all of these different things. Like that gets really exciting. And then, you know, we were talking before we hopped on, if you pair that, with a lot of the AI stuff, like a lot yeah. of people don't realize, and I was one of them until like a week ago, you can feed data sets into chat GPT and start asking it questions and effectively have it be your tier one data analyst. And yeah. it's like, oh, holy crap, if I can go and plug into all of this data and I can have an automated AI tier one analyst, and then I and you know, whatever analyst I have on staff spend our time actually going in and doing deep dives on those insights or those questions that were raised, like, Holy crap. And I mean, you know, I spent a lot of time with a lot of growth hackers and stuff like that. And just some of the things that they've come up with, it's just like, oh, wow. Like you can go and pull like this nugget off of their LinkedIn profile and you can go bounce it off of like local information and drop something in there as an aside. And it's like, it looks like you really did your research, but it's yeah. like, no, you're actually just scraping a bunch of stuff and pulling some data in, but you're doing it in really, really fascinating, creative ways. Why well, didn't you're making it personal? At least you're using all that data to then make the feeling of, I really know you, I really know who you are, what you're looking for, and at least I can serve you an experience that's going to satisfy. Yeah. And I mean, it doesn't have to be at like a one-to-one -one individual level that you've done the research and the due diligence. And I actually tell, you know, my sales team all the time, like, start at the broadest level of it as far as doing your buckets of segmentation and your due diligence and your research and customization and then work your way down uh, with specificity as there's the need and there's the justification for the effort involved in it um but you can do customization segmentation whatever you know at every one of those stages yeah well and, and then there's the other side of i think you don't, don't start one-to-one -one because that one-to-one, -one, I think we've all gone to automate that. 
But, but that's, that's the piece that I see like chat GPT, great, all the automation, love it. Take me out of the stuff that I don't have to do so that I can focus on the shit that I'm good at, right? The human stuff, the connection piece. I think that's, but that's the part. But that's the key to it that I think we keep screwing up when it comes to tech which is instead of, okay, I've been freed up to go do these other things that are really, truly value add. Instead, it's, okay, easy button, that's taken care of. Now I can go and do something else that, you know, I'm not going to say it's not value add, but it's usually in a completely different direction or hell, it may be that you don't hire somebody anymore because now you've got that, you know, automation or technology layer and so now you don't even have somebody to go and do that more advanced, sophisticated things that you ideally would have been freed up to do. Well, and, and the things that to me, I feel like are the differentiators, right? Like we can all go in and get the emails written for ourselves. So now what's the differentiator, right? We can all go in and automate the emails and send a million of them. So what's the differentiator? Yeah. It's got to come back at some point to then, okay, we... And with all of this augmentation to help assist us, but we've got to then be the differentiator, which is, I think, the big potential for self right now. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it goes back to that you know, piece that I said I was most excited about, which is around the intense signaling and being able to actually provide help and value add around specifically what they want. <laughs> well, and you shared a story with me in one of your past employers. And if you can, I'd love to you give me a five-minute recap some of it for the listeners, they might go, okay, some technical. So, so make sure the acronyms are, are out there so we don't all get confused. We don't all get confused on a few of them. But walk us through some of the things you were doing because this is fascinating. I mean, this was this was a case study that I, I love to hear. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh, when I got brought into, or actually when I first interviewed at Astronomer, um, you know, my CRO was telling me about like all of this background of it. And I was just sitting there. I was like, dude, I'm literally salivating at what you're telling me as a, you know, demand gen person. I was like, I've never had a sandbox like what you're describing. And so what it was is I uh, astronomer is built on the, uh, airflow open source project. Airflow is a data orchestrator. So it's basically the pipes that allow you to plug into different systems and move data around. Um, and so. They own that open source project in the sense that like 70% of the commits to the core code of that you know, software are made by employees at Astronomer. The upshot of that is basically all of the publicly available documentation, guides, stuff like that around Airflow are published, maintained, hosted by Astronomer. So you may have no idea who Astronomer is, why you're on Astronomer's website, that you're even on Astronomer's website. But if you're using, considering, researching, whatever, using Airflow, you're probably going to wind up there. Um, and so we had three different layers of tech trying to detect and take educated guesses at who these companies were. Um, and we were identifying to the tune of five to 8,000 new companies a month that were coming into this. And we were taking all of that data all the way down to which pages, how long they had spent on it, how many users, how many sessions. We were taking all of that. We were pumping it into a CDP, a customer data platform. Um, and then we were marrying that with all of our marketing automation data around, you know, all of our <clears throat> emails that were being sent out, links being clicked on, forms being filled out, marrying it with all of our ad data. So what companies were engaging with seeing your ads, stuff like that. We were going and looking at like, hey, are they posting uh, a job for, or are they hiring for, or have they just hired for somebody that would typically be in this role? Uh, we had an NLP layer. We were going and mining like publicly available you know, uh, posts and stuff that they had put out there on different social media platforms. Uh, and we were taking all of that together and mashing it all together. And we wound up with such a reliable uh, score on those accounts for who we needed to focus on and target. Um, like we were talking about, the, the ironic challenge to that was is that uh, uh, Airflow and the astronomer's flavor of it is so flexible, it can be deployed just about anywhere within an organization. So we would call into these companies with like a 99% you know, degree of certainty they were using Airflow. And we would talk to people and be like, no, we're absolutely not using Airflow. Like, yeah, you absolutely <laughs> are. <laughs> no, you literally <laughs> don't know it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but, but what an amazing intent signal. signal. So now also I think your, your, your use cases were just absolutely and that I actually missed and neglected to mention the the craziest part though. 
when I had reps calling on these companies, I was able to equip them all the way down to this is their pain point. Wow. This is what they're trying to solve for. And by the way, here's articles we've written, or here's a recording for a webinar about exactly that. So now just drop that into your conversation. Like, Hey, I thought this might be interesting to you. Like you don't know what the world's going on. And it's like, Oh, holy crap. Like that's exactly what I wanted to look at. A little casual, casual flex. flex. I, I, can I can just sense, sense there's sellers listening to this right, right now going, now, like, um, I'm salivating. I want this type of data. data. Um, Jason, come, come over my organization. organization. Uh, <laughs> Jared, Jared's a very <laughs> lucky man to have you. Um, so I got to go back. This is, this is super fascinating. We could go on a whole other topic just on this intent data piece, but what made you get here? What brought, you know, take me back to, to little Jason and kind of your background and, and how the heck did we get here where you're a rock star growth marketer and dying in all of these intense signals? Man, that is a circuitous uh, journey. Uh, <laughs> like you mentioned, you know, grew up in startups. Both of my parents are serial entrepreneurs. Um, uh, you know, sort of grew up being groomed to take that over at some point. Then fast forward, I graduated from my undergrad degree. Uh, we were on the verge of bankruptcy. Uh, and so I came in and worked for a couple of years trying to come up with a plan to get us out of that. Um, we managed to do it by the skin of our teeth. I mean, we had leveraged everything the bank would take as collateral. Um, and I mean, we were, we were in healthcare. We were, we were one lost lawsuit away from having to just shut up shop. Um, and by the time we got through all of that, like there wasn't much of a company left to run and there was virtually no family relationship left. So, um, it was like, okay, how quickly can I get out of this? And so that's actually how I wound up in Knoxville. I tried to run away from the business world and go into academia. And so I came here for a doctorate in philosophy. My dissertation advisor took a job at another school that didn't have a doctoral program the summer I started my dissertation. Um, so I jumped ship, got an MBA, wound up right back in the business world. Yep. yep. And I, uh, you know, I, I graduated into the great recession and like an idiot was like, okay, nobody can get a job. I'm going to start my own company. Um, <laughs> so I did that, wound up on the verge of bankruptcy again, but, you know, coming out of that, I was doing some consulting and turned out one of the two co-founders of Cirrus Insight happened to be here in Knoxville. His wife was a professor and she was teaching at uh, Maribel College. And so I got connected up with them. It was just the two co-founders at the time. And I was the first hire. Um, and so came in as their VP of marketing and yeah, yeah. worked for nearly five years, had a small exit out of that. And then it's been, you know, different roles in, you know, uh, marketing partnerships, damn engine growth, whatever, with a couple of, you know, short stints running my own agency and mixed in there. That's, That's awesome. awesome. And, and talk about a lot of knowledge. I mean, everything, everything from, from healthcare and legal profession, profession, it sounds like to academia. academia. Now, now you're a, a professor, professor as well. And, uh, yeah, uh, business, business ethics, ethics right? right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so doing a lot of that. So um, go back, you know, you're just graduating. What advice would you give yourself coming out of that, either the MBA program or your undergrad, now looking back? Yeah, it would be, yeah. And this is hard. I've got a lot of sympathy for it, especially, yeah, my oldest daughter's 14. So, you know, I keep trying to tell her, it's like, you're too young to be worrying about this stuff, but she's worrying about college and what she's going to do and all of those things. But the flip side of it is I think most of us wait too long to start making those decisions. And, you know, a lot of the wariness around it is, is unfounded because if you look at it, it's like, you're probably going to pivot multiple times over the course of your career. So just go into it assuming wherever you start, it's not going to be wherever you're going to wind up, but pick something and pick the earlier you pick it and the harder you lean into it, the more successful you're going to be. Um, and so if you can have those conversations, you know, happening early, if you can find places where the community exists and people are talking about it, or you can start getting engaged in it earlier on, I'm like, holy crap, what a advantage that is for you whenever you actually go out there and start trying to find that job. That's, That's massive. massive. Uh, Casey, Casey was just on one of our last episodes. episodes. He, he said, follow the fuzzies. fuzzies. And, and for him, it was this idea around when they make, make you feel fuzzy, right? When, when they make you feel warm and fuzzy and good, like, like follow, follow that path. path. And, and I, I think, think mixing that with pick plan early, set a path, and actually commit to it, right? Those two things right there, combine those, we've got some major, major. Keep in mind, like there's, 
there's different roles and responsibilities within any of these industries or any of these companies. So it's like, yeah. it's not like going business now pigeonholed you into marketing or sales or whatever. Like there's all kinds of flexibility to be able to go and find what really fits you and what gets you going and makes you excited and actually makes you want to go in. And I think it's, you know, arguably maybe the one thing I do well as a hire or a manager is trying to recognize where there is that that connection and that fit and where there's not, and then trying to fine tune roles, responsibilities around what those people really get excited about and do well, and then find ways to be able to pass off or you know, hire for those other pieces of it. And so like rarely, you know, six, 12 months into hiring somebody, is that person doing anything close to the job description that we interviewed for to begin with? So, so true. true. And, and, and it's, it's so interesting because you, you go into one company and you can say, oh, it's this role, and you can look at the same title in another company, and you can do a totally different it. Oh, yeah. Different. Yeah, I mean, it's like one of our <laughs> one of our weekly LinkedIn lives that we have at uh, uh, Rev Genius is WTF is Rev Ops. Because it's like, <laughs> you talk to 10 people about what Rev Ops is, you're going to get 10 wildly different answers. A hundred percent. Yeah, we, we just, just had a uh, Rev Ops leader on, and, and like one of his things was, I, I'm, I'm customer, customer support, support for, for my sales team. team. <laughs> like, that's, that's, it's, it's amazing. amazing. It's, it's a great, great way to think about it. But other companies, they have no view on that. It's like totally different. I'm an analyst. I'm doing metrics and numbers. Or I'm a Salesforce admin. Or <laughs> yeah, yeah, really different. So it's, it's a fascinating world out there. Outside of work, where can we find you? What are some things that you'd love to do on the weekends? Yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, you know, Jason at RevGenius.com, obviously. Come hang out in uh, the RevGenius community. Um, hit me up there. Um, what do I love to do on the weekend? You know, like I said, I've got two young girls, 10, 14, so they keep me busy with extracurriculars and stuff like that. Uh, my wife and I are super into live music, so we usually catch, you know, three, four festivals a year and then, you know, probably a dozen plus concerts. Uh, in fact, we've got uh, uh, Death Cab for Cutie coming up on Monday, coming through here in Knoxville. So excited about that. I was going to say, you're in a, you're in a good belt for sound. Uh, there's a lot of music down in here. Yeah, we, we, we catch a lot of people in Knoxville coming between like, we've got Asheville, we've got Nashville, we've got Atlanta, we've got Charlotte. And so like we're crisscrossing and trying to get to those they'll stop in Knoxville all the time which is pretty awesome that, that is cool, cool. Well, very nice and, and I, I'm, I'm guessing 10 and 14, 14 I've got, got five pieces I'm thinking your, your nail colors, colors are going to be changing in a few weeks, weeks. no no, no. no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of funny I uh, I stopped drinking a few years ago and with that went my strategy for surviving the teenage years yeah, yeah, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. I was like, I'm going to be heavily medicated, but now, like, now I don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I think you, you will survive it, right? Follow the signals. signals. Um, so, um, so one, one more time, time Jason, give, give everybody, everybody uh, the details where they can find you. A shout, shout out to the Rev Genius, Genius community. community. Um, yep. All I like it. Uh, uh, email me, jason at revgenius.com. Uh, find me, Jason Hubbard, on LinkedIn. Uh, come join RevGenius.com, the community. So hit me up on Slack uh, in there. Um, but yeah, uh, any of those channels work. And I'm, I'm going to give a shout out. RevGenius Rev is a free community for individual contributors to join and get on. So if you have an email address and you're anywhere related to sales or revenue, my, my advice is get on there. It's free and start networking, start building. No pitch slapping, but please download <laughs> that and find some, some others that, that share your commonality. So with, With that, that Jason, Jason, I want, I want to say, say thank you so much. much. This, this has been an awesome episode. episode. Looking, Looking forward to getting this live soon. Tim, thank you so much, man. Hey, hey thank, thank you. you. And, and on, on to the, the next, next one. one. So we'll, we'll see, see you soon for the next episode of B2B EQ. And until then, Jason, thank, thank you again. again. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.